using biology to maximize growing systems. Now, this is something we've been working on and with for almost two decades. And what I can tell you is when done properly, this system works more reliable, more dependable, and more predictable than anything else. It requires a different management and mindset. But this is, as I see it, the only viable way out of the situation that's facing us with dependency on synthetic fertilizers. And so when we talk about plant nutrition, we're going to include the atmospheric gases of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. We have to bring those into the equation because they are 96 to 97 and a half percent of the plant's entire dry matter weight. There's no way possible you can successfully farm and grow plants absent the conscious management of these atmospheric gases. They're also gases that you can't buy. Fortunately, none of the fertilizer suppliers sell carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and, and nitrogen gas from the atmosphere. We have soil-based ions or elements. Typically what we refer to as NPK, calcium, sulfur, magnesium, and then a host of trace minerals. The boron, manganese, copper, zinc, cobalt, molybdenum, nickel, and so on and so on. And so we want to discuss the role of each of these elements in the plant. Our soil-based elements account for approximately two to three and a half percent of the plant's dry matter weight. So as we look at this, the shortfall in industrial agriculture is the primary focus is on NPK. Sometimes we're applying lime or sulfur and often a few trace elements, maybe boron or zinc. And the focus is on very, very few of the overall minerals. And so this approach over time has been the basis for a lot of chemical rescue products, insecticides, fungicides, herbicides. So as we move through here, biological agriculture concentrates on about three and a half percent of the entire nutrient profile of a plant. Biological agriculture takes into consideration the fact that carbon is 45% of our plant's dry matter weight. Oxygen is 45%. Hydrogen is 6%. Nitrogen is between one and one and a half percent. And then you have phosphorus, potassium, calcium, sulfur, magnesium is 2% and the trace elements make up half of 1%. But in a biological approach, you have to manage for all of these elemental components that become part of plant structure. So that is really the focus on what we wanna talk about. And I wanna try to bring you into a different perspective of how we manage this. Because during the creation process, when the world was put together and life was brought forth at different stages in different levels, minerals and resources have always been kept in a insoluble balance. This was required because anything that's soluble has the tendency to either volatize or leach, it can be lost. And so nature in preserving itself 
holds all of these elements in insoluble or unusable forms. Well, before any life form could come, microorganisms became the intelligent system that altered the inavailable, insoluble state of all of these minerals into a soluble state with no waste. So we're gonna walk through that process and how this happens. What is the difference between these plants? Both plants are in the same field. From the same seed, they're approximately 150 feet apart. They both are dry land plants. Both receive the same amount of rain. One received chemical fertilizer. The other received seed treatment, which was microbes and minerals, biological stabilizers, and some 1034 to provide early phosphate energy. The difference in these plants is a 400% yield increase. Look at the size of the heads, look at the size of the leaves. So simply put, the plants on the right had far more nutrients available to build structure with. Now, when you go back to looking at plant structure, if carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen is 96% of the plant's dry matter weight, what we did created the bulk of the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen transfer. And it was only accomplished with microorganisms and food sources and soluble minerals. So this brings us to the concept of mineral fixation equals cellular reproduction. And so as I've thought a great deal about this, this principle really sums up how fast things can literally grow. And as with those sunflowers, they were all planted at the same time, but the rate of growth was massively different. And that represented a 500 acre to a 2000 pound per acre increase. Uh, I'm not sure if Paul is on, but he has accomplished a 4,000 pound rate of sunflowers. So imagine those sunflowers that we saw on the right and double the size of those plants. That's what's possible when you begin to involve the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen management in these plants. So with this explanation that, that I'm trying to explain things with, the rate of mineral fixation directly controls the rate of cellular reproduction, both in plants and in microbes. This encompasses all the structural elements of the cell and the enzyme activating elements building the cells, some 75 trace elements. So if I can explain this in a little bit simpler terms, a plant cells cannot go through cellular division until it has the mineral profile to sustain the new cell in a healthy ratio. It has to have all of them carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phospotassium, they all have to be there with the trace elements because that cell has to function. But it's also the same with a microbe. If we want the assistance from microbes and we want them to grow and produce the solubilizing mineral effect that they do, microbes can't split, they can't grow, they can't replicate without all the minerals for them to make a new cell either. And so the mineral rate that is soluble becomes the rate in which cells can reproduce. In a microbe, in a plant, in an animal, 
in an insect. And so this becomes a critical factor in the way that we have to look at how plants and microorganisms function. The faster we have fixed minerals that are available for a plant, the faster the cells and in the microbes are able to reproduce. So let's just go back and look at a 50 year transition in corn. If we go back into the late 70s, Dr. Don Huber had referred to approximately a dozen farms that they were doing research on. And it was common for all of these farms to be at 300 and over bushel of corn. I remember Don saying that corn was the healthiest crop in the US and that very little fertilizer was needed to produce these yields. As the amounts of synthetic fertilizers increased, so did the disease rate. Now move forward 50 plus years in areas we're struggling to grow 150 to 200 bushel corn. There's a great deal more NPK needed. The corn crop is highly diseased. It's rare that a year goes by that there is not a new bacterial or fungal disease in corn. And so we are using a massive amount of herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides. And literally the use of synthetic chemicals or synthetic fertilizers and chemical pesticides have continuously suppressed the life in our soil. They kill soil microorganisms. Salt and acid destroy soil structure. And so the more we have applied this practice, the more we have damaged the very soil and environment that we rely on to produce our food. So synthetic fertilizer, if we go back to this, let me give you a little history on how this all came about. In 1908, a Jewish German scientist by the name of Fritz Haber discovered the process of taking nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen, and converting it to ammonia, NH3. And this process was heralded as a great advancement in technology because now we had a synthetic form of nitrogen that could be used to grow plants, but it was also used as an explosive. Just a little further background on Fitz Haber. He also was the German, the scientist ahead, head of the German Biochemical Warfare Division for Germany. He developed the carboxyl dichloride or phosgene gas. This was first used in April of 1915 in World War I in Belgium. And this gas broke the Hague Convention agreement where biological chemicals would not be used in warfare. This particular gas was responsible for the vast majority of chemical induced deaths in World War I. But this gas had some drawbacks. It was detectable, you could see it. It was a cloud, a greenish cloud that came and the allied troops quickly learned that by using a wet rag and putting it over their mouth, the, they could shield themselves from the effects of the chlorine or phosgene gas. Once in the people's lungs, it burned their eyes, it caused blindness, it would turn to hydrochloric acid in the lungs and destroy them. And a, a very, very effective, but it wasn't, it, the allied troops figured out how to get around it pretty quick. So in turn, Fritz developed what they would call nitrogen gas or mustard gas. Now this was odorless and colorless and it was far more deadly. You couldn't see it coming. 
And within about 10 hours after exposure, you had uh, massive blisters, gas mass didn't stop it, clothing didn't stop it, and it would destroy your, your lung tissue slowly. It took you one to two weeks to die in a very terrible death. And that was also another one of his fine creations. But last and not least, he, after World War I, he turned to the development of further pesticides and toxins, later which were used by Germany to kill those people in the concentration camps by the millions. And it was his research and work that led to this. He was also known as the father of chemical warfare. So this transition into synthetic nitrogen has been around since approximately 1908. So just a little over 115 years. Before that, we used biological forms of nitrogen. And so mankind somehow managed to survive for more than 5,900 years without destroying this planet on biological forms of nutrition. And we didn't have the diseases before then that we see in our plants and our vegetables and those things that we grow now. And so I'm just stating a simple obvious fact that with synthetic fertilizers and toxic chemicals, we have made a massive shift in not only how we grow plants, but in the quality of food that we grow with it. You go back and you take a hundred year study on the nutritional content of any food that is grown under the influence of synthetic fertilizers and chemicals. And there's a huge reduction in the mineral content, which also means there is a huge reduction in the nutritional content. And so after a hundred plus years of this experiment, I'd say it's time to take a hard realistic look and go back to the original processes that were given to us that we can understand far better now by the creator when all of this was put together. So that's where we're headed.